thank you, Chair. First, allow me to start by conveying my confidence with uh, the heads of our security services, that is the DCI, the two DIGs, and the IG, uh, on their training, on their capacity to do strategy and also command of our security organs. Mr. Chair, I have very straight and uh, specific questions. My first question goes to on Annex 1, Mr. C.S., you said you never touched nothing on Cordon 1, or the first, the inner circle has been touched. But uh, the second circle, that is the second Cordon, was touched. With There is some interest in three residents of the Deputy President. And uh, within the three residents of the Deputy President, I think the one in Karen, which also doubles as his office, and uh, another one in Iskoi, and I think I think I think is Nakuro Android. That one is where uh, the second cordon. We have GSU officers who are undertaking the guarding services of those residences. The GSU officers were interchanged with administration police service officers. Uh, there is also. Apart from the interchanging, there is also the aspect that there were reduction in numbers. It was not one for one, as in you removed you remove 30 years of officers and bring eight administration police officers. Uh, so I would want clarity on that. Uh, did we remove GSU officers doing the second circle? within these three homes of the deputy president and in the change with them with the administration police service officers and uh, in that if that happened in the course of it did we reduce the numbers of the personnel of the numbers of the officers uh, number two how is the command in terms of we are talking of especially because the first layer and the second layer, these are people who are always with the deputy president. And at some point, they will find themselves at the same place. Let's talk of the current home. The people guarding uh, the general areas and uh, the presidential escort unit. These are all armed officers, are all officers under the IG, no matter where they're coming from. How is the commander at that time? Who is in charge? As in now, we have administration police officers guarding the gates and the general areas. Then we have the uh, commission of police. Then we have the presidential escort commander. Who, who, somebody somewhere, one of the officers has to be in charge of at a certain point. We can't just have everybody in charge, three commanders from three different units taking charge of uh, the same residence at, at a particular time. So who is in charge at that, at that time? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, we are... Had... Last one, because there are many interests, please. Mr. Chair, it's better we take the whole day here and accommodate these questions. Uh, you you, you can ask we... that question, Honorable, please. You can ask that question then in the second lot, because the others also want to ask one question. Is. Oh, thank you. Yeah, because yeah, the chair, the person we are talking about is in respect to what uh, Honorable Chibugut has quoted on the Constitution, the duties of the President and uh, what the President does to this country. In the same Constitution, in case there is absence in the office of the President, the person we are discussing with the Deputy President is the person who will take charge immediately. So, actually, this is a, like a spare President, and it's not an office that you can discuss in how way. Chair, let me go by your instructions. My, 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 my last uh, concern, order, order, let him finish. which is a concern, actually. Order, order, I'll give you. I'll give you order. Just finish. Move to finish. Okay. Yeah, Masara, to uh, My, my, that issue, let me leave one of the questions that go for a concern. I believe the action taken 
has uh, in a way uh, opened up our security agencies to unnecessary scrutiny. As in, there were no discussions before this action as, in, as to who is superior between the GSU and the APs. And uh, now the removal of the GSU and the bringing of the APs as is the one which causing the aspect that there is some downgrading, that the, the, the security has been downgraded because the, the GSUs were superior to the APs. I think, Mr. Chair, that is something which should be addressed, and especially by the IG. It can't go out to the public there because it means the other Kenyans who are being guarded by the APs out there, they are not as secure as they would be if they were being guarded by the GSU. So I, I think, and uh, in the wisdom of the his deputy, the, his ex the deputy president, actually he will come to these officers and uh, he, he spoke about his uh, confidence in the work they are going to do. And uh, it was very clear in the media and in the public domain that he was comfortable with, with the APs who, who had been brought to his residence. So I would want to see the same, and especially from the office of the AG, uh, a firefighting kind of mission to to not to downplay that reasoning of there is one service which is superior to another. Thank you. Yes. 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 One minute. Yeah, chair, uh, this is a house of records. In our constitution, there is nowhere written that we have a spare president. So I don't mind to remove to withdraw that statement because it's nowhere. In our constitution, there's no spare president. Indeed, uh, Honorable Mbai, did you refer to the Deputy President, His Excellency, as a spare president? No. <laughs> I never, I never did, Chair. Yeah. So if if he, if in case he did, uh, then uh, I order that to expunge that from the records. <laughs> Honorable King, thank you very much, Honorable Master. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me start by appreciating the security team. I have uh, a lot of confidence in uh, Kenya security operators, their professionalism, and the organization. Uh, having said that, I think there's a question that the chairman alluded to, and uh, other members have also uh, asked. And it is a bigger question. Uh, of the topic right now, the reason, the reason why. Why did the change have to be done? Why now? And given the fact that um, the service study orders and even the Act give the GSU the responsibility for state house and state lodges, unless one is arguing that that the state lodges are somewhat superior to the resident, official residence of the deputy president, then even the question of downgrading can be argued that there was a downgrade. Because if, if a state lodge which is visited even rarely, sometimes not visited even once a year, is being guarded by GSU, then one could even argue that it is a downgrade. Secondly, the strength of a security force is not the strength of the person standing at the post. It is the strength of the chain of command. It is the strength of the depth, the backup, as we would call it. For instance, the G company that uh, guards the state house is backed up by a Reiki company, which has got sufficient equipment, uh, uh, training, and it is configured as to enable that force to intervene if they need be, to be able to uh, do whatever is necessary depending on the circumstances. So if you bring the uh, SM, uh, SGB to the equation, then what becomes of the chain of command? What becomes of the backup plan? How does it work? So the question why it was done, I think it's too pertinent, and I think it's a big question uh, in the minds of, of the public. Uh, 
uh, finally, I don't want to bury into this. I think the, as much as we talk about the inner security layer and the outer layer, it has been tradition and it has also, it is also captured in the act and the standing orders that the GSU does protect. So I don't believe, and I would like to be explained to how the Inspector General has discretion in changing something which is provided for by the Act and the Standing Orders. So my question is, why? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I hear that the, the bigger question around it is, are there GSU officers guarding the residence of the Deputy President? And I think I hear that everybody, and it's cutting across all members. Let me clarify. Yes. The second layer, because that's, that's the argument, that the second layer uh, has been changed, the inner layer has not been changed. The second layer state house is to GSU G company, backed up by the Ricky. And it would be make sense, it would make sense when the second layer was GSU, backed up by the same uh, uh, Ricky company, which has the capability and training to back up. I, I get it. Now the, the 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 police chiefs are here. They'll be able to take that up. The last one was another point. But, 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 but a point of order, Chair, Chair, I'll be asking my questions. What, what is out of order? You are in the next next round. Yes, I, I think as members of the security committee, we can also not just be throwing words. When you say state house should be guarded, as same officers as the residents of the deputy president, there should be reference to the law. Understanding orders. And Andre Bokinyangi, the law talks about state house, state lodges, the president, and the deputy president, not the residence of the deputy it, president. Yes, in deputy. fact, I had wanted that to come from the yeah. honorable CS so that they can give us details. I had that question, but let him uh, uh, clarify on that. Honorable Ambu. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah. I will actually start my question from where. Honorable Kaluma has just gone in. I wanted to ask the I wanted to ask the CS to clarify for us according to the law. We have had we have seen the act, we have seen it being shared very widely. I have heard my colleague Honorable Kinani suggest that uh, the deputy president's residence should be above state lodge. That's where I just understood him to be suggesting right now. But the law is very clear. We have the president as a person, the deputy president as a person, state houses and state lodges being guarded by GSU. <laughs> what I now wanted to understand, what is the definition of the deputy president's residence according to the law? Is it, is it categorized into something that then becomes part of what is in the law to be guarded? That's my first question. My second question goes towards timing. We live in this country, all of us, and I'm sure you are very alive to the fact of the politics. Thank you. I think this is better. But I'm sure you had the first question, so I'll just go to the second one. We live in the country where we are very alive to the politics of the day, and I'm sure you knew that the decision you made was going to be politicized. And I wonder whether you actually factored in how you are going to deal with that. Um, in this time and age, there are going to be people who are going to take a decision like that and make political capital out of it. And I say this because of the very interesting observation I have made. The principal himself, in this case, who is the deputy president, is on record saying he has no problem with the changes that have been made. However, his allies, every single day, are using this to play politics with. And so the question now I have on this message. Uh, you will allow me. You, you will allow him to finish just you like you are allowed to finish. Yes. Well, yeah, you are allowed you to finish. There is something that you not continue. Honorable Bombay, I allowed you to finish and then I took the point of order. That's how we shall conduct business. Thank you very much, Chair. The question I was making is it is on record. The principal himself has said he has no problem 
with the security arrangement that he has. His allies are the ones who are playing politics with this issue. And now the question I have is, we have a public letter from the chief of staff of the principal complaining about this. Then we have the principal himself saying he has no problem. At this moment in time, who do we engage with? Do we engage with the public statements from the principal, as security officers, yourselves and us? Or do we engage on the public or the official statement from the chief of staff or from the issues that are coming up from the allies? My third question. We have a situation, and I want to, it's something about order of command. Um, it has been raised by a couple of my colleagues here the issue of when you bring in new formations around the deputy president, is there a structure that takes over that formation and says that now you've come in around the deputy president, you report to this particular office, or what exactly happens? I ask that for this reason. When we have a situation where a VVIP has security officers who are police officers, who are then protecting situations that are not um, legal or lawful, as my brother Masaro might have raised, who do you question at that moment in time? You have a situation where police officers are not allowed, are not supposed to allow us to have public meetings. And then I have a public meeting. And my police, my security uh, escort is there with me. Are you able to ask him, as the IG, to give you information on what that particular issue that arose, that arose? Because maybe that is part of the problem we're having here. My final question, which actually has been sent to me by somebody from Nyeri, who apparently, I didn't know we were live, is does the law determine how many officers a VVIP is supposed to have? Is there a constitution? Because sometimes I feel as if part of the reason we're in this problem, I have looked at the historical security of all the uh, vice presidents that we have had. The decision that has jumped from that if some leave me with five, I will actually come and complain that you have downgraded my security, despite the fact that the law says I should only have one. So part of the problem, and maybe the question you can help us is, how did you make the decision to have 257 officers? And is that what the law requires the deputy president to have? And at what point do you then reduce them? And is that, does that go against the law? Thank you very much, Paul Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Mujiri. And I, I think I asked that question from the onset. Another question that is troubling everybody including I asked whether if I want to beef up mine, you can allow that to happen, and you skipped it. Maybe this time around you will be able to address it. But uh, what, what is out of order? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Chair, we are discussing uh, the matter of security, actually government, the Deputy President, the CS, answering questions about security, which is government. I don't know where the issue of uh, allies are coming from. What is allies in government? What is allies in government? Well, well uh, I, I hear you, but I, I, I hope it's not me you're asking. If you ask me allies in English, I know what it means. <laughs> I'm asking through the chair. Uh, Honorable Wambugu said he's allies. So I'm wondering, we are discussing government and security and the deputy president. You want, okay. what, what is his what, allies? What are, what, what are allies, Honorable Mujeri Wambugu? What are allies? Thank you very much. I'm actually very happy to answer that question. The reason we are seated here, uh, when, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, just to explain who, yes. who allies are. The reason we are seated here the is that of allies. there was a complaint that was public. That is what has raised us, given us opportunities to make us actually someone the CS and his team. That complaint has been public. The allies are the people who are associated with the deputy president, his friends who are looking out for his interests. And I don't think, right. thing. I, I, I I think, think it's actually a good thing. Yes, I think, I think and this, he alluded to, and this is very important, Honorable CS, he alluded to a letter written uh, to IAG of police by the chief of staff, and I think that needs to come out. So that in case, and if indeed it happened, then we, we, we also want to be private to the contents of the, that letter. Honorable CS, I think you can go. Thank you very much, uh, um, Mr. Chairman, sir, and thanks, honorable members, for the questions that you have asked so far. Um, le let me uh, start in, in the order in which they were raised. The question that honorable Mbai asked is about downgrading and whether or not we should comment about this. Let me be very frank, as a public officer and the minister in charge of security in the country, 
most of the debate that is going on about this, and anyone you hear talking about downgrading, definitely they display some measure of very frustrating ignorance. For example, the IG has got over 13 other units, some of them crack units that he could draw from in providing support to the deputy president security. When the deputy president moves, for example, to some parts of, of, of the country, if the IG feels that he needs to bring in SOG or QRT or so on, you see people are raising questions. Many of the people are debating these things. First of all, don't understand the entirety of the formations of the police service. They don't understand the strengths and the capacities that we have and the training and the capacities of all the other formations. So people have just proceeded from a propagandist easy point of saying you're downgrading the, the security of the, the, the deputy president and so on. We're not looking at the facts as they are. In that layer too that I, 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 I have, I've used to demonstrate to you that we actually call these in operational terms support services, you know, because the core team that is supposed to protect the, the deputy president is the presidential escort. This is what is prepared to protect the deputy president. Whether he is driving, walking, flying, what have you, these are the people, it's intact, he's protected. Then support services, the IG has got over 13 units to draw from, to provide support services. What tells you that this unit is stronger or weaker than the other one? Mm -hmm. And over a period of time, given the resources that we have uh, deployed, there are other units that actually you do not know of that probably have got stronger and even better capabilities to do certain things. Because uh, let's look at Article uh, 10 of the National Police Service Act. It's very clear. The IG shall determine the distribution and deployment of officers in the service. And how does the IG determine? He uses the information that is given. He uses the intelligence that he receives. And from time to time, he will make certain changes. Why are we second-guessing the IG in the decisions that he has made when he has made so many of that decisions, uh, of such decisions in the past on other, on other areas? And we have demonstrated clearly that the deployment in terms of personnel and asset that we have given to protect this office and the holder of this office is very strong. In fact, Mr. Chairman, some small counties in this country like Viga and, uh, and uh, Nyamira, for example, probably don't have this kind of uh, uh, deployment and in terms of even assets as it were, in providing the support that we are providing with this office. So the question of downgrade, and I sorry, to sorry, what did you say? I'm saying that the, some, there are some counties that are smaller in, in, in the country, the smaller counties like Viga, for example, probably don't have the strength of deployment and the capacities and assets such as we have deployed to protect the holder of this office. So, so, so when, when, when people jump up and say, oh, you know, this downgrade and so on, in quality and operational terms, you'll have to go into an operation room and listen to the director of operations tell you everything about this before you make that kind of conclusion. I want to state here again categorically, for the record, there has not been any downgrade of the security of the deputy president, period. So, so, so this, this banding words around really, honestly, is, 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 is not fair. Why was this done? I explained to Mr. Chairman. I am willing to discuss that, but I can't discuss it in an open meeting. Because that is that amount of sharing the notes of the National Security Council or the Minister of the Council in an open meeting like this, and I have no clearance through that. Why and the background of this rearrangement, I cannot discuss in an open meeting. Because I'll be going deep into an operational issue. Are you, I'm not are, allowed. Are, are you able to discuss in camera if you have clearance? You have the clearance to discuss in camera. If you provide this is the committee that oversights the issues of security. If you provide an in camera proceeding, maybe I will discuss that. I will be able to explain the background of that. But but I can't explain it in, a, in an open meeting like this because now I'll be I'll be moving into the realm of operational issues, and then and my colleagues here, the heads of the agencies, will not allow me to go into operational issues in an open meeting uh, uh, like this. Um, the 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 it's clear. Let's just be very frank with each other, M Mr. Chairman, honourable members. The deputy president's residence is not a state lodge. It is not a state house. The law is very clear. It's black and white. It's a residence. It's a residence of the deputy president. It's not a state lodge. It's not a. It's not a state house. You know, there's some things which look or sound politically sensible, but it, frankly, when you go by the law, they don't. How would you come up and use phrases such as are being used and, and so on? The framers of the constitution. You are the legislators. Give me a law to work with on this basis. Give me a law that designates the residence of the deputy president and makes it a state lodge. Then, on the basis of that law, I'll gazette it. 
the, the, the statement of said lodges is very clear. The law is clear, the record is there. You know the state lodges and state houses that are supposed to be protected by GSU. The, the residence of the deputy president is neither a state lodge nor a state house. Is this a mimi na fikiri hapo, Mr. Chairman, ni sawa. Just proceed with the rest. Yeah. So, so, so the, the question of the politics of, of the decision that we made. You know, we are public servants. We, 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 we are public servants. We work uh, in a manner that we know we are going to be accountable to the public through members of parliament, through a committee like this. When we take decisions, we, we don't wake up in the morning and look at the weather and look at this. We make a decision that we believe is right to make at a particular time. We know that there are certain times where some political practice comes with some sympathy addiction. You know, the sympathy addicts who look for sympathy over anything. And we have watched that sympathy addiction around the country where, you know, people draw sympathy over everything, you know, and so on. But you see, let me ask you a question. As people who expect these wonderful, good people seated on my left here to provide security for you, how would you operate in an environment where they wake up in the morning and check the political temperature, the weather before they make decisions? We believe in making right decisions. And the decisions that are right and necessary will be made, regardless of the time they are made. And then, and then and I keep saying, we in the security sector, we don't do this work to be popular. We, we, we would rather be right than popular. We want to do what is good for the country, what is good for the officers that we have been given to look after. If I had an opportunity and explained to you and Mr. Chairman went into details about how this decision was reached at, you will be very happy with us because you will know that we have made very serious considerations and this Inspector General, this gentleman seated to my left here, is a very considerate and very responsible public servant. So, so to cast as passions and say, oh, you know, why was this done and so on, this is not a whimsical decision, it was a culmination. It was made after several considerations have been had. But as I say, I can't discuss those considerations in an open meeting unless, you know, you have an in-camera session at which I can discuss that and I, and I will share with you uh, to an extent about that. The question of responsibility of police officers. You know, Mr. Chairman, this gives me an opportunity to respond to something that everybody asks me all the time. When public officers, for example, when members of, uh, you know, government uh, go to court and they are charged, for example, with murder or with very serious crimes, why does the Inspector General withdraw police officers from them? He do that because you don't want to put officers in conflict. Because you cannot get officers and tell them uh, to go and commit a crime or to accompany you to commit a crime, as it were. I, I understand and I hear you, uh, honorable members, when you are saying uh, if we are breaking the law, we are breaking COVID regulations and we are in the company of police officers, what are we supposed to do? We all start, first of all, with the fundamental good faith in all of us. And as I said earlier, there must come a time in the positions that we hold when some of the actions we take are driven by our own moral positions. So if those leaders, some of them senior in society, feel that what they are doing is the correct thing, uh, of course it's for the public to, to, to judge. But we have kept pushing our police officers, and I know, I am aware, because the Inspector General has told me, that he remains in constant communication with senior police officers in the command of those who guard such VIP officers to ensure that they also assist in ensuring that the law and order is maintained. We hope that this situation will improve, but I can hear the concern that the honorable members have and will continue to work at it. Is there alone the number of deployment? There is no law. I'll be very happy if you enacted one. Maybe if you actually enacted one and said for every holder of an office, uh, you would be entitled up to X. It would be very happy. I mean, we will all be very happy, and I'm sure that the gentleman to my left will be very happy because it will make the work much easier uh, as it were. But now, as it is, I, I give you this example, Mr. Chairman. If today, for example, the holder of that office uh, requested that uh, I have uh, a bujari in Rongai <laughs> and I need the bujari to be guarded. <laughs> and you refused to guard the butcher. <laughs> then the butcher was attacked tomorrow. I mean, if we are insulted now, look at how we are being excoriated for just a routine reorganization of security. Can you imagine what would happen to us if that happened? So when a request comes, we accede to it. And then, then, then we, we, we keep moving forward. And all these wonderful men in the police service are doing so in good faith. And, and the question here then was, 
up to what extent will you keep on acceding to request? Up to, up to which number will you then stop? Because uh, uh, as much as you're answering the others, you, you will now open uh, this, this line for us to be able to ask for extra police officers or security officers for that matter. Well, uh, please enact a law. Let, let, I think let's, let's end that bit there. If you enacted a law that brought about limits, that brought about, um, talked about numbers, uh, and then, then, then we can be able to uh, solve that problem once and for all. The letter from the chief of staff that was written to the IG and to the Inspector General, I mean to the Head of Public Service, and copied to our PS, Dr. Kibicho. You know, the less I said about these things, the better. Uh, to be very honest with you, because of one thing. Uh, you can notice how, in some cases, Mr. Chairman, to be very frank with you, we are, if we are not careful as a country, we are sinking to new laws. Where you would, where in this world, just tell me, Mr. Chairman, where in this world would a holder of an office of chief of staff in a senior office like that write a letter and put it in social media before it even reaches the Inspector General of Police? Where? And then so on. You know, this issue has been characterized by some very juvenile activism, petty propagandism, and so on. And then the facts are lost in that process. And then we don't want, we, because we are respectful of the institutions that we work, we don't want to go that direction. And we are not going to respond to those kinds of antics. We will do the work that we have been asked to do. That's why you have noticed that there hasn't been any correspondence from any one of us, including our Inspector General of Police. Because there are some institutions, if you subject them to disrepute, you erode the institutional respectability of your country, as it were. You end up vulgarizing the authority and legitimacy of those offices. Because the ideal situation is that if you are a chief of staff in an office like that and you have a challenge, you go to your charge. Your charge is the head of public service. You don't even write to him. You pick up the phone because you have an extension to him and you ask the head of public service for a cup of coffee and you discuss those things internally. This new wave where everything is written and sent to social media, this propaganda is that you. We have a responsibility, Mr. Chairman, and I want to undertake to you as a public servant. We have institutions, we inherited these institutions, and we have a duty to hand over institutions to the next generations that are intact with the respect that they deserve. The respectability of security sector institutions is not going to be vulgarized and dragged through the mud because of sympathy addiction and all that kind of thing. Thank you, sir. Right, okay. We, we will then take uh, Honorable, Honorable Mbai, you have already spoken. So we are going to the next people. There are people who have not asked questions. Honorable Rosa. Honorable Kaunya. Honorable Shuria. Thank you, Chair. Chair, first of all, I'd like to thank you for having been proactive given that the matter we are discussing today has really been around and is causing a lot of tensions, I'd like to thank you for having been proactive. In the same breath, I'd like to also thank the CS for giving us such a detailed explanation. The reason why I'm thanking the, PS, the CS is because information is power. And what is happening today in this country Mr. Chair, is that we are being governed by propaganda. When I look at the details that the CS has given, Chair, I feel sad. I'm saddened to know because what the country is being fed on is that the security detail that is in charge or is responsible for the security of the person of the Deputy President has been tampered with, has been withdrawn, and therefore, he's been, left and, uh, he's been left exposed. When I look at the presentation that is before us, it is clear, and thank you, CS, for giving us this history. When you look at the history of the security detail in terms of the presidential escort unit for each of the 
former vice presidents of this country, it is clear that none of them had more than 14. All the former vice presidents had no more than 14 presidential escort units who were responsible for the security of the person of the vice president at that particular time. But the, it is clearly demonstrated here that the current holder of this office has 74 against 14 of all the former vice presidents. And this is why I'm saying that it is good that we have this information now so that the country can breathe and stop being governed by propaganda. When you compare the 74 to the 14, I will go further and look at the security in totality, where the current office holder has a total number of 257 or thereabout, either looking after security in his person and also security of his businesses or private businesses, 257 against the highest of 57 of the Honorable Raila Molodinga when he was the Prime Minister at that particular time. So we are comparing 257 with that highest of 57. The reason why I'm bringing up this comparison is just to quell out that propaganda so that Kenyans can actually see the reality that indeed one office has 257. This clearly brings me back to Animal Farm by George Orwell, where it says that indeed we are, or we are equal, but some people are more equal than others. And the demonstration here clearly shows that if you are a holder of the office of the Deputy President, you are indeed more equal than any other Kenyan. And Mr. Chair, I'd like to request the CS at this particular point, because I know Kenyans are watching, Kenyans are anxious, Kenyans feel exposed and unprotected. Could you kindly, in a very gentle manner, also let us know that as much as we are discussing the security of the Deputy President's office today, how exposed are these Kenyans? What is the ratio of this police security to the Kenyans? I would like to request for that. I would also, my second question, Chair, and I was quiet when everybody was talking, so I just request members to also give me that yes, opportunity. Yes, My you second spoken, question. You let Honorable Rosambu speak, and then you'll ask after that. I if there is a point of order. Yes, point of order. That, that is how we are conducting business. Yes. Please. My second question is I'd like to know from the CS in his office, is there a code of conduct that governs how you carry out your routine responsibility? For example, because everybody is asking, why now? Why now? And we've clearly seen that there was just a rearrangement. Rearrangement to me, coming from a background of being a teacher of English language, does not mean withdrawal. It does not mean downgrading. It is rearrangement. So I would request the CS to kindly let us know, is there a particular code of conduct which should govern your routine actions so that if you are withdrawing, if you are, if you are replacing uh, an AP called Otieno with one called Kipiegon or another one called Wafula, are you bound by a code of conduct which should govern you and make you talk to the officer or talk to the deputy president's office first before you replace Otieno with Kipiegon, with Wafula, or if there's an Asian with uh, Yatin. I'd like to know if there's a special code of conduct and if you actually didn't follow that code of conduct, then why? That should be the question, not why now. Because if it's routine, I imagine that you, are, you, you, you can carry out your routine activities. But I'd like to know, is there a code of conduct that governs your actions? Okay. Where you have to... Done? Um, Chair, I hope you, have, you, have, you have done two questions. You have done two questions, and I don't want to be selfish by doing another one. Yes. But I hope you give us an opportunity to speak as Kenyans, uh, as leaders. Because, Chair, I think as leaders we must bear responsibility for this country. The people propagating and the people causing this propaganda and bringing the country into so much tension is nobody else but leaders. 
Right. But hear, leaders on false information. I hear you. I hear you. So let, you. let's do it this way. We finish with the business here, then uh, uh, you know what you can do as a politician, but uh, not in the committee. Yeah. Honorable, Honorable Kaunya. Point of order, Chair. Before what is out of order? Thank you very much. Chair. Just one moment. What is out of order? Chair, this is a house of record. Honorable, my sister, Honorable, we have just mentioned that we are governed by propaganda. The right word is that. Other people want to guide by propaganda. We are being guided by the constitution. <laughs> the current government is governing. But what I correctly, what I said is seemingly. Yes. What the current okay. current country you are is doing right now. Of English. Is... Mm -hmm. I have two questions, uh, Chairman. Um, speaking with a background of having undertaken training for some of these officers that provide VVIP training and uh, the critical infrastructure and vital installation protection. Uh, chairman, last year, uh, 2018, His Excellency the President, Huru Kenyatta, launched a police reform program that was meant to harmonize the command and control of officers in the field. And this, uh, I believe, was implemented. And my question is, Chairman, my question to our CS is if indeed these reforms took place. And in these reforms, Chairman, you would recall that under the Constitution, the National Police Service is comprised of two units, the KPS and the APS. The distinctive roles were clearly specified in this arrangement of the reform, where the APS under DIG, uh, APS, was to undertake that protection, critical infrastructure, the border, our borders under the border patrol units, and of course the protection of the VVIPs fell under that unit. And uh, the Kenya Police Service were to undertake other roles as specified. And uh, these roles, I believe, if that was implemented, and I think that's the question I want to ask the CS, then the question of all these rearrangements is actually chairman misplaced because the units that are supposed and they have been trained very well on protection of very important people, VVIPs and VIPs, at the gender service unit and the APS. And Chairman, you recall just uh, a week, two weeks ago, Chairman, we were at Kanyonya Chairman, you recall, uh, where we have the Border Patrol unit and the training. You witnessed the kind of training of the QRT, for example, the Quick Response Unit. It's one of the most well trained units that actually is supposed to be guarding the president. Now, based on that reorganization, uh, CS, if you can clarify, even for the public, it would really help everybody to understand that aspect. The second question, uh, I believe that uh, our police officers are well professionally trained and they are doing a good job. Of course, they need to be funded in those uh, areas of shortcoming. But Chairman, there is something that needs to be clarified by the CS. Whether there is a gap in law in terms of the numbers we deploy, uh, more particularly Chairman, I want to give an example. In America, when Donald Trump was elected to be president, 
he resigned from all the companies he was guarding. I think there's something not very, very clear about what the CS brought out that uh, requests for guarding of even a butchery. <laughs> I think this question has either gap, and I think the CS, if you can clarify, then chairman uh, propose as a committee, we come up with amendments to make sure some of those gaps are fixed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I thought you would start by saying you are previous commandant of which college? Chairman, I was uh, commandant of the AP Training College at Ambakasi, and uh, some of these officers who have been deployed to guard uh, is uh, the deputy president. Uh, some of the most well trained internationally, not, not local training, they are trained internationally. Okay, thank you. So, and I'm um, very, very have the confidence that uh, they, they, they have what it takes to do their job. Thank you. Honorable um, Shuri. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my, I have two questions for the CS. Uh, there was this famous gentleman by the name Kenei. Could he tell the committee, was this gentleman a GSU officer who worked at the DP's office? Was he a GSU officer or an administration police officer? Uh, question number two. Uh, Tongi. I think he came here because he's from, is it Yamira Map? No, 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 no. I, let, let me clarify. He is, uh, he is wanting to ask questions and I'm telling him I received no notice. So if you gave me no notice, we're not going to allow. Those are in the standing orders 195. <laughs> yeah, I have only one notice from the Honorable Junet. Okay, uh, proceed. Thank you, Chair. Um, question one was whether Kenei was a GSU officer or an AP officer, and I think he worked at the DP's office. Question two, um, the CS did mention he cannot share the reasons as why the changes occurred because of operational reasons. Just, um, is the deputy president supposed to be made aware of the changes prior to the changes happening and the reasons why the changes were made? If so, was he briefed? prior to the changes being made. Thank you, Chair. That, that question had been asked, so uh, you can only may, maybe go over the answer again. Now, Chairman. How the Honourable by? Because there are people who are not asked questions, and they are members of this committee, and they need to engage. So uh, allow your colleagues. Clarification, Chair, not a new question. Not clarification. Let the others finish. Be fair to them also. Uh, we want to take final round because uh, of time. So, uh, Honorable Sears, I want to take the remainder of the people so that then you can answer all of it together. Then you come to a close. Is that okay or is it too heavy? All right, okay. For those who haven't spoken, uh, oh, yes, Honorable Tekla Tum, uh, who is uh, following us virtually, can you ask a question now? Ask your question now. Honorable Chair, I have uh, two or three questions and uh, comments. And, and make it brief because of time. Eh? Yeah, I'll make it in, yes. Thank you. What does the Constitution say about the security of the deputy president? Number two, was he informed when the officers are removed from his residence? Number three, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, research, uh, there was a research done and it has shown that Kenya is number four uh, of the people uh, who are having stress levels. Honorable Chair, we are one year with less with the elections and uh, we have to take care of everything we are doing now, even in the security. I normally talk very well of our security apparatus and I know the CS is very good in his job and he has to tell the people who are doing the operations and the transfers and all are used to 
do things in the right way. Honorable Chair, as politicians that if you the pre a president inclusive, have a following. And you cannot control the people in such scenarios. So, Honorable Chair, let's not take things easy. It is not as easy as that. As members of the security, we want the security of all tenants and the top leadership inclusive. That is my contribution, Honorable Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Honorable Dr. Tekla Tum. I can confirm that we have had all your questions and the CS has taken note. We will leave you and we'll keep you on so that you can get the answers when he starts uh, replying. Uh, Honorable Jeanette, sorry, it's not Honorable Jeanette, sorry. For the remainder of the team, um, the committee, because the standing order say we shall first give the members of the committee, those who are interested, Honorable Kaluma, and then Honorable Vice Chair. Then in that order, after that, we'll go to Honorable Junet. I thank you, Chair. I thank you, CS Chair. I traveled from Ube to Nairobi by road uh, last night. In fact, I arrived here, Chair, you remember. I, I communicated with you at 5 a.m. in the morning, believing that the deputy president was exposed. Chair, I'm saying this because from the statement I have here, I disturbed my person traveling by road of a person whose security detail is bigger than the entire security detail guarding Homer Bay County. <laughs> and I think I want to request that in as much as we play politics, we should not play politics with matter security. Chair, to put this matter in context, the deputy president in his usual manner says he has no problem with the security organization around him. But the politicians around him are saying there is a downgrade and undue exposure. And on this, based on that of his chair, is occasioning unnecessary anxiety in public mind. So, so Chair, my first question or request is that the people around the deputy some are not just politicians, CS. And in as much as you are saying you should not be bothered by the letter which came from the chief of staff of the deputy president, the public concern about this matter commenced from that letter. Yeah, I saw it on Twitter and I asked what was happening. In fact, I was asking why didn't the deputy president's chief of staff knowing the security channels and arrangements, you know, speak with them in a manner that protects the integrity and the professionalism of our security apparatus. So that, Chair, I will be seeking your directions at the end. That in as much as the CS and his team say they are not politicians, they want to do their work and leave it at that, the matter of the conduct of that chief of staff in the office of the deputy president being an employee under our charge as parliament is a matter that must be dealt with. So that I'm confirming that after this, if it does not come from the committee on its own motion, I'll bring it before the committee so that it can come here and tell us the code of conduct under which he operates when he writes and posts things in the social media in the manner he's doing. But see yes, this matter has been uh, taken as a discourse outside there because the members of the public and the media, which is our main channel of communication, do not take time to understand the law beginning with the Constitution. In fact, CS, I'm shocked at the manner and the extent to which our very competent officers in the administration police service have been undermined. And you hear people comparing our APs to even G4S. I think we don't understand what the administration police service is and the Kenya police are. So I would have requested 
that because the media is here and Kenyans are watching, you